Hello and welcome to the second episode of The Walls Could Talk, a podcast presented by Interrupted Art. And I'm Stephanie Crosengoss, the founder of Interrupted Art. And I'm so excited to announce our next guest on the podcast, who is Marina ruiz Colomer, And she is the director of contemporary art at Sotheby's and head of middle market sales, which includes uh, day sales and also online sales. But we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, Marina has been in the middle of some of the most sensational and exciting auctions that Sotheby's had in recent years. And I definitely want to get into that a little bit more uh, during our discussion. But first, I wanted to start with um, how you got into the art world, which wasn't necessarily the straightforward path that other people have taken. So um, you start, you studied economics yes. um, in your home country of Spain yeah. and then went to go and work at KPMG. Yes. And then suddenly decided, did a big of a U-turn and thought, I'm going to retrain. Yes. Did a master's at Christie's mm -hmm. and started at Sotheby's. Yeah. Um, yes, I think this is a, one of the stories that prove that there is hope for anyone in <laughs> any <laughs> career um, to switch. Um, I, as you said, yes, I studied economics and business in Barcelona. And um, when I finished economics, my parents kind of told me, oh, you, you can do a, a course, just a, a summer course, <laughs> wherever you want. <laughs> and um, I had seen there were these, these summer courses at Christie's and I did one of those. And I remember there was this one moment where we got taken to Christie's and one of the specialists who was touring us around um, took us to the basement. And she's just talking and all of a sudden she pulls this canvas out of one of the racks and it's a Warhol. And I'm like, what? She's like <laughs> touching this? What? How? And um, she's just very casually just telling us, oh, yeah, we saw this last week and whatever. And oh, next week we're doing this other thing. And I was like, how does one get to where she is? Yeah. Um, and I could. I could hear that she had a Spanish accent and I went over to her and I was like, so, so what have you studied? <laughs> and, and she said, oh, you know, I studied journalism and then just came over and I'm here. And I was like, wait, you don't have to study art history. You don't have to be an art history major in order to do this. And she's like, no, I mean, it's good if you study some of it, obviously. Um, but that's not the, you know, there can be other things that you study. Yeah. Okay. I know there was that. I think that is that common yes. misconception that you have to do art, history of art, and then go straight into working in an auction house or a gallery or something like that. I think a lot of people now are, are coming from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. and actually that's really enriching. Yeah. The, like the art industry. Yeah. I um I did something similar where I studied classics at university, and then I went straight into corporate for five years, and then had a bit of a moment, a bit like you, oh where I was God. like oh, no, I want to retrain and, yeah. like, you know, I'm going to go and do a PhD in classics because I really want to go and work um, in a museum mm -hmm. and um, then find that you can actually have commercial jobs in museums. Yeah. And you're like, right, I'm just going to take the plunge. I'm going to make the switch. Exactly. And, I mean, I, I would say you do need to, especially in, in a case like mine where I came from the complete opposite end of um, the job spectrum and, you know, I had been doing transfer pricing of all things, has nothing to do <laughs> with art history um so that is why i i did do a master's um and i chose contemporary art because i couldn't understand why so much of it was worth what it was worth and and you know why certain artists were considered to be so important versus some historical names who weren't selling for that much in at auction particularly mm. um so I, I kind of I wanted to understand why what what was the the reason behind these things, um, and it's it's been incredibly interesting and it's been a roller coaster and it's been really fun. Mm. I mean, you've been there for eleven years now. Yeah. So you and if anyone knows the secrets of Sotheby's is going to be you, a the ins bit. and outs. Maybe we won't go into too many secrets, <laughs> but you know I'm really fascinated to learn a little bit more about how an auction house works. Mm -hmm. So. I think we're all familiar with those big headlines mm -hmm. and like sensationalist, um, you know, newspaper headings of, you know, this particular artist sells for this record breaking mm -hmm. multi-million pound, whatever, whatever. 
And that's the kind of view, snapshot, I think you get of auction houses. Um, but actually what I'm really interested in um, is about like how you even find those artworks in the mm. first place, how you bring those collections together, how you curate them, and then and how you get them ready and present them for auction. Yeah, I, it's so interesting that you mentioned this because that is what, you know, we as auction houses, we pride ourselves in being so transparent and we kind of assume that everyone knows how auctions work and how auctions are put together but actually that is not the case um you know most of the time whenever someone i know finds out what i do they, they're like oh so so how <laughs> and um and you know it's it's a combination of different processes how do you put an auction together it's a labor of months sometimes years mm. um uh some of it is proactive some of it is reactive so you know we had our auction in in march and the day after the auction, you already start thinking of, okay, what's next? And um, some of it is, okay, so what what things did we price for the last deadline that didn't come in that we can chase? So things that maybe we were considering or uh, if we've done a valuation. So another of the services that we provide and we have a whole department that do this is valuations of people's collections. And, you know, we get loads and loads of requests. Sometimes it's for three items. Sometimes it's for 20. Sometimes it's for 2,000. <sighs> and it's because we have all of that data, we can say, actually, oh, this this work that we've valued is worth so much more now than it was in 2015 when we last did this exercise or you know right now is a very good moment to sell this artist so some of these conversations come from reactive things that we've done yeah other things are completely proactive so because we know where the interest is at where the demand is at we we go through a lot of data that again we have and actively contact certain clients saying you have a work by x artist who is selling really well right now would you want to sell it mm. um so so there are it is a combination of things yeah a bit of a balance and um i guess also thinking about those kind of trends as well mm -hmm. you just um you just sort of stopped on there it's really interesting to know i would love to know more about like how the trends are set so whether you know who's leading these trends is it the sort of the big international private collectors is it you know are the auction houses doing it are the international museums doing it I mean I'm very aware from like working at Tate mm -hmm. we would we had this symbiotic relationship with auction houses where we would be building the collection and sometimes we would be bringing in artworks from auction houses um, but never really got to the root of it where it was like a bit chicken and egg you know, like, so is it the museum sort of putting on the shows and then auction houses following? Or is it like auction houses doing the sales and then museums thinking, oh, this is a good, you know, let, let's follow this trend and let, let's let's put a, a display on? It's so hard to, to say what comes first. As you say, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. And this, I feel that this is where it really shows that the art world is a very close-knit network and that no part can be independent from the rest. Mm. Um, so, you know, I know that from a, an institutional point of view, sometimes we kind of want to skew the commercial side of things, and that's completely fair. Um, and from a commercial point of view, sometimes, you know, oh, no, this is too institutional. But at the end of the day, things are so tied, and one thing affects the other. And um, when it comes to trends or, or you know, I kind of don't like to talk about trends because mm. uh, it, it makes it feel like we're not necessarily behind what we would sell. But yeah. but yes, there are moments where certain things are more in demand for sure. Um, we always look at um, institutions for sure um, and we look at what is happening out there. So we look at what, what artists have been um, represented at the last Biennale who's representing certain countries, who has been included in big, exciting exhibitions. So as, a, as an example, um, the last Biennale who had, the, there was this huge um, presence of female surrealists. There seemed to be something in the air. And 
you could say, well, but you know, female surrealists have been around for decades. Yes. Um, but they they hadn't been as valued and as kind of looked at as they have been in recent years. Mm. And, you know, maybe the Biennale is a culmination of all of that, where they are finally given a space, an institutional moment to be celebrated. You know, Tate also had an amazing um, surrealist show. A lot of female surrealists represented there. Um, We have been setting record after record for female surrealists at auction. Um, And different galleries are also representing more female surrealists. They are doing more shows. Um, So I think it's not one, one actor that leads but it's more of a combination. Mm. Um, So it's very hard to know who is the first person to to kind of decide. Um, But it it kind of all goes together Mm. and it builds together, I would say. And I can imagine though, at different moments, it might be like um, you have a sale and you've got something in the sale that everyone starts a sort of real like bars and a bid and, Mm -hmm. you know, the the bids are going up and it's, it's all getting really exciting. And then suddenly that might spark a bit more of an interest in the public. Absolutely. And then the other parties in the art world start reacting to that. Or in a different way where there might be a big show at um, the Met or Tate or whatever. And then suddenly there's more demand in the auction houses. So I guess, you know, not that everyone has their turn, but it can just, there's so many moving parts. Absolutely. And, you know, and and we definitely look at uh, what is happening museum wise whenever we are you know let's say Cecily Brown um who currently has a show at the Met so if I'm going to talk to someone about Cecily Brown I am going to mention that oh she has a show at the Met right now it is great everyone in the United States is go or New York is going to go and see her work and this is a great moment to offer your painting because Right now, there is some institutional interest and there is some public interest. So it's it's all these external factors that mm. affect. We call it the halo effect. Uh. Um, and <laughs> um, but it is it is true, and it definitely I would say the anticipation of of a show of works by an artist definitely is one of the factors that drives demand mm. for their work. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, mm. I mean it's. It's almost, you know, looking from the outside into the auction house. Mm-hmm. It does, like you said, your Sotheby's is incredibly transparent and you can, anyone can go at any time yeah. and see any of the displays there, but not really, you know, understanding the environment around it yeah. and just, like you said, just seeing the bits and pieces. You mm-hmm. can't necessarily in your mind fit them all together. No, because I guess, so we are very transparent and that we are one of the most transparent actors in the art world. Mm. Um, We have to. Um, But at the same time, a lot of what we do is so confidential because we do deal with very important collections and very confidential clients. Yeah, of course. Um, And we were not in a position where we can share that information. So I guess it's a a big combination of both, of the being very transparent about our results and how... um, and how much we sell and for how much and you know all of that is accessible in our website it's very easy to to see and and access um but on the other hand how we do these things is very very confidential yeah i know well i know how confidential you are i've been trying this morning to get information <laughs> out of you for the next sale <laughs> and you're absolutely zipped up there's nothing coming out of you for that but everything will come out in time i'm absolutely. sure absolutely um and again, talking about trends, I wanted to ask you actually about your your sort of personal achievement in in setting trends. Mm-hmm. And you know, you, we've touched on female surrealists mm-hmm. as an example, and that's definitely something that's been very prominent um, that I've seen coming to the fore over the last few years with the solo shows and um, and the sales. But women artists in general. Mm-hmm you know, it's def- there is so much more of a spotlight on that now and Thank so you. much more of an awareness and you've played an important part in that in the auction world especially. Um, I'd like to believe. Yeah, um, well, no, you absolutely have and I'd love to hear more about how you've, how you've done that. Yeah, so um, 
personally, I've I've always been interested in um well I, I guess in a similar way as as I got into contemporary because I wanted to understand why certain things were more than others. I it, to me it it stood out why the the why were women not selling for as much as their male counterparts when mm. so many women are incredible artists and you know you can get into a very political <laughs> and kind of a very long discussion about why women haven't been valued as much as their male counterparts um but in essence i when i started noticing these things i was the head of the day cell and one of the ways i had to kind of bring women into more prominence was a to how you position them in the order of the sale so as head of the, as the head of the sale one of the things that you get to do is the order and the order of the sale is super important um and it's like a big headache and and you kind of you have let you have around 120 works that you had to put in the correct order in mm. order to achieve the highest result and there is a lot of you know, there's things that are high value and there's things that come from very important clients and you can't put them at the end of the sale and there's <laughs> promises and there's, you know, there's all sorts of things. But you do have some leeway there. You do have some creativity to kind of start the sale however you want. And what I did was I used to start my sales with a work by a woman. And, you know, it was kind of subtle um but it did get noticed which I was uh very happy about and then um two years ago me and and another colleague we started this a different a complete separate sale to the normal kind of normal seasons of February June October so different sale it was called women artists and women in brackets um because so many well Women artists do get labeled women artists, but mm. we never talk about male artists. No. Um, so it was a bit of a, a pun on like like mm. women artists. <laughs> um so so we decided to do this cross category sale. Um with the first one had works from old masters to contemporary. And it was a really interesting way to create dialogue between these works. And like remember the first sale we had, um, had this work by Rachel Roish, um, an incredible old master who was very successful in her lifetime um, to the point where, so she had 10 children, I think, and she was an artist and she was more successful than her husband who kind of ended up taking care of the children because she was very successful and very yeah. busy, um, <laughs> which unheard of. Yeah, you incredibly know, unusual. Very unusual. Yeah. And um, and she did. She had done the the painting that we were offering. She had painted when she was twenty two. Then on the contemporary front, we had this amazing work by Jenny Savile, which she had also done when she was twenty two, and it was so interesting to see them together. Um, because you know by the time that Rachel Roy had done her work, she was probably a mother. She you know she was very established. She had done her thing. Jenny Savile was a student. Yeah, that was one of the first works that she exhibited um, up in Scotland. So, you know, it was a very different kind of two works to see, but very interesting connection to make. Yeah. Um, and there was there was a, a work by Francois Gillot in that sale, um, who is widely known as one of Picasso's muses, but actually almost never referred to as an artist in her own right. We actually made the record for her in that sale like by many multiples of the estimate <laughs> and this is what this sale has been so helpful for um bringing attention to specific artists who haven't necessarily been recognized but also bringing attention to women in general mm. as incredibly important incredibly interesting artists that need to be paid attention to yeah but as individuals as well not in conjunction with you know they were taught by that particular exactly. person or they were a muse of that particular artist exactly and that's how they've been known yes just in the sphere of males exactly than, so kind of separating yeah. them from the narrative that has been historically 
um been attached to them of oh you were they were so and so's muse or so and so's wife or so and so's yeah. whatever um so that that was what this sale has done mm. um we've done it for three years now and you know it's gotten to a point where this last march our our marketing team put on a whole campaign around women throughout the month and it was something that you know had started as oh should we do things about this sale but then it kind of took over the whole month and took over the main season where we had you know panels we had events we had exhibitions we had an exhibition called women makers of um ceramics in in our main galleries and that is just that's what this sale wanted to do Mm. um just to sure it started as this sale but it it seeps into the main seasons and it seeps into the main what what we're doing in general as a company where we're celebrating International Women's Month, International Women's Day or w- Women's History Month. Mm. Um, so that's that's what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. To start with, I, you know, this idea of presenting women first and almost sort of under the radar, not yeah. necessarily underground, people can see what you're doing, yeah. but like, you know, just subtly doing it yeah. and then it mushrooming into this, you know, this much more prominent, yeah. importantly, more prominent thing. That's, I think that's fantastic. It's really cool. And, you know, um, it's obviously I, it's not all my work. I work with different colleagues. Um, but, you know, you, you talk to different heads of sales. And, you know, at some point, um, one of my colleagues, who, was the, who is the head of the evening sale, she did a sequence of um, women to kickstart her sale. So for me, that was like, yay, like that's that's what we need to be doing. The evening sale is the one who needs to be starting off with eight works by by women mm. instead of having a man start or whatever and yeah. then you know our there's there's another sale that we um started doing in also 2021 in New York and then London also started doing this sale it's called the now sale um which as the title reflects is all about the now um and it is about what artists are hot or in demand or interesting you know so it is kind of what is what are the artists to watch right now um and this sale has actually had a lot of art by women in it in recent in its recent iterations to the point where in some sales there's more art by women than by men which is so interesting that's like that's refreshing yeah yeah that's fantastic Yeah. yeah that's so good to hear and I guess something that's also quite important to Interrupted Art is really thinking about, we deal with more emerging artists mm-hmm. um, uh, rather than more established artists that you'll be selling. But it's very much, I like to focus on what are, you know, what is happening right now. Mm-hmm. You can go to the museums and you can see they're normally, you know, they're retrospectives. There's, they do obviously show artists that are still practicing now and you can see their latest things, their latest collections. But, you know, what are the new trends that are coming through now? What are the new interests that are coming through right now? And you can see that a lot through emerging artists mm-hmm. because sure. they haven't established quite yet mm-hmm. exactly what their style is. They're, you know, they're, they're switching and changing and evolving all the time. So it's quite interesting. I mean, I wanted to actually um, talk to you about collecting and more, you know, more generally mm-hmm. art collecting. Um, and I can't say that I'm a, a big, big collector, but I do like to collect emerging artists um, to have in my home. And even collecting from the same artists, you can see, you know, I'll collect one from like you know, an, a, a piece from 2020 mm. and then another piece from 2022. And you can see these subtle Change. differences yeah. that, that they're making and then evolving and changing and the trends that are coming through there. Um, but I really wanted to ask you about you're collecting and like what you have in your home I, I'm incredibly passionate about thinking of what what we have in our home and how that impacts us and yeah. how we surround ourselves in that sort of artistic environment so I mean the the one amazing thing about working in a auction house is that you see this incredible art the bad thing about that <laughs> is that you then become 
really spoiled and um, kind of snobbish about yeah. what you acquire. Um, but so what I've collected or what what we have are mostly prints because those are the things that, that this is how you can start. You mm. know, um, these are the more affordable um, works by artists that you might admire. Um, so, for example, I have a print by Michael Armitage, um, whose art I adore, but I <laughs> couldn't afford a, a painting. No. Um, but, you know, having a print is something that I'm very happy about. Um, I also love um, Sanya Kantorowski, um, so I have a print of his work also. Um, but then someone like Michaela Yearwood dan um, I was very lucky to get one of her works before she became what she is now. Oh, and ahead like of I, the curve. I know, right? Um, <laughs> no, but it, you know, it's it's kind of talking to, I would say, talking to gallerists, talking to friends um, and being open and um, and kind of sometimes taking a punt. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have a work by... Uh, friend um who i love what he does and and his his art is doing better and better um you know he he's a a ceramicist and again one of those things like at the time i bought the work i didn't necessarily know that ceramics would become what they have become right now um yeah and i i don't know that i could afford what the the work that i have now um so so i i would say Talk to friends, go to gallery openings, talk to gallerists. Um, that is how you can, first of all, see a lot of art mm. and then decide what you like. Um, and then I, I think gallerists, especially I would say in smaller galleries, it's easier. They're very happy to show you and, and kind of just chat about what they have or what you know oh this is your budget so maybe you don't get a painting but you can get a print or you yeah. can get a work on paper or yeah that's that's how i've good place done to it start so far. Yeah. yeah yeah and i suppose also being you know seeing these artworks every day you probably get a lot maybe a lot quicker than someone that doesn't work in the art world and yeah. more of an idea of the kind of things that you like yeah um, and sometimes um, I think that there can be this, these two elements to it where it's, you know, sometimes you can see something and you just like it mm-hmm. and it can just be a beautiful piece sometimes of art and it doesn't like, have to have this big grand, no. you know, background to it that makes it incredibly intellectual. You can just think, I really love that and I want it in my home and I just want to look at it. But I think that's, that's how you should look at the art that you are buying i mean i obviously at at certain levels you also have to do your research because you will be spending a certain amount of money and yes um but in general and and that is something that i tell anyone that i work with you should want to live with the works that you're buying you know buying to put in a warehouse is slightly it's kind of sad it's so sad i know i know Uh, yeah I've worked with people like that in the past um, when I've doing when I've been doing private consultancy, and it's just a pure investment, yeah. and it's going to be in bond, and you're no. just, you know, you've never seen it, you've just seen a, a photo of it, and you think, oh, that is the saddest, because yeah. art is there to be seen and enjoyed, enjoyed. and yeah. if you own it, you can touch it. You can't touch it, <laughs> but not in the museum. Not in a museum. Not in a museum. Sometimes in the auction house. Definitely as a specialist. <laughs> Not always as someone who visits, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. Accompanied by a Sotheby's employee. Accompanied by an employee, maybe, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go around touching everything at Sotheby's. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be welcome again after that exactly. one. Exactly. You might be kicked out. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you um, was about um, if there's been... Well, I can't imagine the temp- not the temptation, but you've already mentioned as well that there's so many wonderful things that are coming through in the sales. If there was just one one artwork or object that has come through the, one of the auctions that you've uh, been involved with, that you could take home with you, this is a very hard question. 
I know. What would it um, be? Huh. I think I've been thinking about this for for the last few months. Um <laughs> I would take home basically anything Louise Bourgeois, but mm. we did sell one of her wool mounted spiders. Yes. We sold it. The last one we sold was in Hong Kong, but I remember we had one in London um a few years ago. And it was so cool. I bet. And I obviously wouldn't have been able to just like put it in my bag and leave. How big it was, was it? Like, it's kind of, it's like a meter and a half by a meter. It's like, it's quite a big thing. Quite heavy. Yeah, I can um, imagine. Yes. But, <laughs> Louise Bourgeois. Sort of stuff it under your t-shirt exactly, and try not, and walk not something out with that it. I could discreetly just like, <laughs> oh, just, ciao. We're just going for a walk. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Um, it, Louise Bourgeois is someone that I've, always loved um and I was very lucky to be able to um put on a show not something that you get to do when you're in an auction house usually because you know we don't really curate shows we, mm. I'm, we do curate our sales as much as we can like within our limits and you do try we we really do try to curate our <laughs> exhibitions um but at the end of the day we have limitations limitations of space you have the auction that you have. And as I said with the order, you do have your high value lots and you have your lots that come from a very important consigner and you can't put them at the back of the of the galleries. So there's a lot of that. Um, but I was very lucky. Um, we used to have this space called S2. It was our um, exhibition space. And there was a kind of a transition between um, the direction teams changing and there was this month where the gallery was kind of free. Um, so me and a colleague um, were able to curate the show. And it was kind of the show of our dreams. Uh, <laughs> we called it. And the show of our dreams was Traumata. And it was about trauma. Yes. Right. Um, yes. It got quite dark. <laughs> um, but it showed the work of um, Louise Bourgeois alongside that of Yayoi Kusama. Mm. And... It was very interesting for us to discover that their work hadn't really been shown together. That is interesting because it, like what you but can see the yeah parallels the, so yeah, much the of synergy it. there. Um, and we like it. That was I would say whenever I get asked like what is your highlight and yeah, that's like that is one of my main highlights having being able to curate that show. Um, we worked with. Uh, Louise Bourgeois' estate, awesome. You know, we were talking to Jerry Gorovoy, and like he was, he kind of went over the whole thing with us, and they lent some works to the show, which was incredible. Um, and then we also worked with um, Victoria Miro and the Yayoi Kusama Studio, and they also lent a couple of works. Um, and we had some very historical work, so some Kusama from the 60s, like some of her accumulation works, wow. um, and some really great bourgeois from incredible collections. Um, and and that was, that was amazing, mm. that, that, that moment. So, you know, Louise Bourgeois for me has always been a kind of big influence, big um, something that I love. Um, so one of those spiders then? So yeah. Do I you think. have it sort of I don't know, just on the wall in the bedroom? Yeah. Just looming over you. Yeah. Adding my to that trauma. I would love that. <laughs> I bet. I mean, you know, those spiders are so cool. Like they can are you imagine really just cool. having one of those in the you know, I know. Room. Well, if people haven't seen them, they should definitely Google well, Louise Bourgeois spiders. We have one coming up on in our evening sale in New York. It is one of the monumental versions. So um, she she did spiders throughout her career. She started doing them in the 1940s. It's a motif that kind of represents her mother. It's very important, central to her. Um, so there are many iterations, but she started doing them in, on paper. But she, later on in her career, when she finally, when she was 80 years old, became more recognized and was given a solo show, she was able to then make them in a much grander scale. And these monumental ones 
are incredible and they are in major collections mm. in in the world around the world like i'm sure um you know the one outside um the guggenheim in bilbao and i think there was one outside tate when she had the show at tate mm. um but yeah we are selling one and it's so exciting like <laughs> so if it goes missing it? we know where it's it's gone yeah yeah we won't, we, we'll wait to release this till after please after you're back from new york <laughs> so they don't they don't cotton on it's you um and i did say that was lastly but i just remembered that i didn't ask you one thing i absolutely have to ask you mm. which is we talked about before the auction yes then you have the big glamorous auction the yes. hammer comes down everyone is buzzing in the room you know with all of these these you know new records set and everything mm. hammer comes down and then um what happens what happens so most of the works go either down to the basement or back to our warehouse um and then once they are paid for most important, <laughs> <Very> uh, important. <laughs> they can be collected um so some some people come and collect them themselves and that can happen as soon as the auction is done but yeah. you just you have to pay first yeah um, they're too excited they need to leave with it yes yeah, so, i mean we have had that which is nice yeah uh but then given the size of of a lot of the works that we sell especially contemporary where everything is massive mm. um there is shipping to be organized and you know as you can imagine um our buyers are from all around the world mm. and sometimes you have to organize shipping to a chalet in aspen course you know yeah i mean of um, course of course i know that was me yeah that was my chalet yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so so you know you sometimes you do get these moments of like oh so can these sculpt can can this go outside and you're like oh you know this sculpture and and they go yeah so so the client wants to put this in their um home in barbados and so it's very humid so we need to know how much this work will be affected by humidity and you know have all wow. these questions yeah. you have to deal with um but yeah um once once things are paid for they can be collected and hopefully loved and looked at every single day by their new owners and then 10 years later they'll get a call from you saying by the way there's a sale coming up exactly <laughs> i know where things are yeah thank you so much thank for you your for time me. marina i've really enjoyed our chat and now i don't feel like i'm an expert but i definitely know a little bit more about auction houses and it's been so interesting to hear about your journey and your expertise as well thank, thank you, you so much.